Hepatitis C is a, it's a blood-borne virus. Uh, it infects the liver. Um, when you get hepatitis C infection, a number of things can happen. Uh, it ranges from a, a very brief uh, illness, which is resolved in a matter of weeks, and no long-term consequences at all. That happens in about a quarter to a third of people who are exposed to hepatitis C infection. In the remaining patients, it, it becomes a lifelong infection unless it's uh, diagnosed and treated. And in a worst case scenario, 5% or less of patients, you can get important amounts of scarring and inflammation in the liver that uh, can in that 5% or less be a life-threatening condition. So it was discovered in uh, 1988. It re was reported in the medical literature for the first time in 1989. Prior to that time, uh, it was possible for this to appear in blood products. So if you had a blood transfusion before we had effective screening tools, which was in 1992, it took us a few years as a medical community to develop the screening tools. So after uh, 1992, it was essentially cleared from almost the entire blood supply. It's very unusual to get it through blood products uh, since 92. And coagulation factors, so people who had illnesses like uh, hemophilia, which is a blood clotting disorder, People who had uh, factor VIII, which was a treatment for that, before 1987 when we changed how that was manufactured, that was also a relatively high risk time to have blood clotting factors. So blood transfusions before 92 and blood clotting factors before 1987. The most common way to get it uh, since 92 is uh, injectable drugs. So recreational drugs, uh, you know, cocaine, heroin, doesn't matter what it is, if there's a needle piercing the skin, there's a risk of transmission. Even if it was on one occasion uh, back at high school, that can be enough to, to transmit hepatitis C infection. Unfortunately, hepatitis C is uh, a silent thing for the majority of patients. Only about one in five people uh, get symptoms that they, that they really notice. A good marker of this is that across the whole country, we only have about 900 cases reported uh, in all states combined of hepatitis C infection. We know that there are about 20,000 new cases per year. So it looks like most people who get the infection don't realize it. They're not presenting to uh, doctors or health care givers uh, for evaluation. So usually it's a silent thing. If there are symptoms, uh, the symptoms can include things like fatigue, uh, nausea, vomiting. In some cases, you can get yellowness of the eyes or of the skin and of the urine, some paleness uh, of the stools. Those are symptoms and signs of the acute uh, infection when you first get it. It takes about 20 to 30 years for people who are unlucky enough to get the long-term illness that's progressive in terms of scarring. It takes more than 20 years in almost every instance uh, for those patients to develop signs of liver failure. And liver failure signs can include Again, the jaundice, the yellowness of the eyes or the skin. Uh, it can include swelling of the belly as you uh, get fluid that collects related to the liver having a lot of scar tissue in it. Uh, there's a risk for liver cancer with hepatitis C if you have cirrhosis. Um, that can present with liver pain or weight loss. Uh, and again, those sort of general weakness and malaise kind of symptoms can also be uh, an issue. And vomiting of blood is a really late presentation of severe liver disease of any cause, including hepatitis C. We think there's about between three and four million people in the United States with hepatitis C. We know that there's only ever been 600,000 people treated. At least half of people d don't have the disease diagnosed currently, and, and most don't have a clue that, that they have so, it. So there are. The, the ways that we're sure about uh, is needle-borne uh, transmission, and that can be uh, either injectable drugs, it could be a needle stick for health care, and it can be the risk uh, ranges from, say, less than 1% to 10%, depending on the nature of the injury, if you have a, a needle stick. So, for example, if you had a, a hollow needle uh, with potential blood in the middle of that, the risk would be higher than if you just had a, a needle that you were doing stitches with or that kind of thing. Other risks uh, include um, things that can contain or have blood on them. So for example, toothbrushes, razors, there's a small risk with that. The risk of contracting hepatitis C through sexual transmission is very, very small. It can happen. Uh, the frequency of that is, is, is very low, however. A mother can transmit it to her child when the child is in the womb and perhaps around the time of birth, uh, there's a risk for that. So children of mothers who have hepatitis C should be considered for screening for hepatitis C. 
Tattoos, we think they're a risk factor, but again, the risk seems to be very small. Uh, it's not a common way to get it, but it, it probably is a, a root. Intranasal drugs, so use, uh, uh, cocaine, whether it's uh, smoked or uh, used uh, uh, in intranasally, those can also be means of transmission. And there's a, a way of uh, using recreational drugs called skin poppers, where you inject the drug into your skin, not into a vein. That can also be uh, a route of transmitting hepatitis C virus. There's a, a number of blood tests, so uh, the medical history often is not specific, so there's nothing you can gain from uh, examining and taking a history from a patient that will confirm, you can confirm a risk or a suspicion, but not whether somebody has hepatitis C. The, the blood test is really two different types. If you have exposure to any virus uh, as, as a person, you will, if you're lucky, and almost always is the case, you'll generate antibodies in response. Your immune system will respond to the virus. And those antibodies often persist forever. So if you were exposed to hepatitis C at any point in your life, you'll probably have antibodies to hepatitis C in your blood. And we can measure those with a simple, quick blood test. Those are called ELISA-based uh, tests. And there's a couple of different forms of that. That tells you that you were exposed to the virus at one time, but as I mentioned before, about one in four people clear the virus just on their own with their immune systems, and about three quarters don't. So if you have a positive antibody test, uh, you need to have uh, a confirm confirmatory test, which would be something called PCR. And the PCR is a very, very sensitive test that measures the virus itself, not your antibodies to the virus, but the virus itself. And these days, those tests are very, very sensitive. Uh, it's been one of the more encouraging uh, disease areas uh, from a medical and a patient standpoint. If you go back to the early 90s, we had maybe a 12% cure rate with the treatments, and now it's close to 50% cure rate for the most common form of hepatitis C. And this is probably a good point to uh, point out that there are six members in the hep C family. We call those genotypes, and they're numbered one through six. About three quarters of people have genotype one. This is the most difficult one to treat. And using the standard of uh, care treatments now, which are two drugs called interferon and ribavirin. Interferon is an injection that you take once a week. And ribavirin is a pill that you typically take twice a day. The duration of treatment is between 24 to 48 weeks, depending on the type of virus and how you're responding to it. And the cure rate for the most common genotype or subtype is about 50%. For genotypes 2 and 3, which are the other most common ones, the cure rate is about 80%. So uh, it depends on the subtype and also depends on other things like how much scarring you have in your liver, how high the amount of the virus is in the blood, how old you are, uh, what your weight is. Those kind of things also factor in. There are also some things that you shouldn't worry about. So if you're somebody who has hepatitis C, or if you have a member of your family or a loved one who has hepatitis C, it's important to know what things don't transmit it. So for example, you know, hugging, uh, kissing, sharing knives and forks, plates and cups, the risk of transmission from those activities is exactly zero, so far as we know. Um, avoiding uh, any kind of recreational uh, drug is Probably not a bad idea, but injectable drugs certainly have the highest risk, and that uh, is the most frequent means of transmission currently. Uh, nasal, uh, and uh, which includes had smoked and inhaled uh, cocaine, amphetamines, things like that are a risk. Personally, uh, I would worry about tattoo parlors uh, currently, but again, the, the risk is probably small, and if you are going to have a tattoo, uh, make sure you inquire about the sterilization procedures. There's a very small risk from medical and dental uh, procedures. If proper uh, techniques are employed for sterilizing equipment, et cetera, and, and handling of drugs, then the risk from a medical procedure should be zero or very close uh, to it. And the same is true for uh, dental procedures where the equipment is handled uh, properly. The Centers for Disease Control makes no recommendation for employment limitations for people who have hepatitis C infection. Having said that, fatigue is probably the most common symptom that I see in my patients who have hepatitis C, and it can be debilitating. Uh, unfortunately, the treatments for hepatitis C really magnify the fatigue part of it. So the uh, fatigue when you're on treatment, if you're on treatment, can be debilitating, and in some cases it can be, uh, even if you're not on treatment, just from having this chronic hepatitis C infection. There are some uh, 
manifestations of hepatitis C that occur outside of the liver that can also uh, have uh, some debilitating effects. So for example, it can cause kidney failure in some patients who were unlucky with a disease called glomerulonephritis, which is an inflammation of the, of the kidneys. Uh, you can get something called porphyria cutanea tarda, uh, where you have this blistering eruption on sun-exposed parts of the skin. Uh, you can also have uh, lymphoma, so a, a cancer of the uh, white cells or lymph nodes uh, can, can be associated with hepatitis C infection. And finally, uh, diabetes can also be associated with hepatitis C infection. There's some debate now in the medical community whether a new, newly diagnosed person with hepatitis, with, I beg your pardon, with diabetes should also be screened for hepatitis C. This is an area of, uh, of emerging debate. As we sit here today, there is no uh, vaccine, nor a very promising uh, candidate vaccine for hepatitis C. Yeah, if you do have a diagnosis of uh, hepatitis C, I, I think it's important to consider a couple of other things. You're particularly susceptible to a bad injury from hepatitis A and B, so you should have your immunity for hepatitis A and B looked for if you have hepatitis C, and if you don't have immunity, you should have vaccines for those too, because we have highly effective, very safe vaccines for hepatitis A and B. Uh, people often wonder, can I get my blood checked uh, you know, for signs of liver inflammation, and if that's negative or if those uh, tests are normal, can I relax about hep C? If you had a risk factor for hep C, those blood tests are not really a good screen. You can have completely normal liver blood tests and still have hepatitis C infection. Blood tests, other than the ones we described, looking for the antibody and a PCR, looking for the virus, are the only ways to effectively look for the infection itself.